good morning. So I'm going to spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so running through a bunch of basic science slides. I'll try to make them as clinically relevant as possible. Um, there's a lot going on in molecular biology, as the outline shows. Um, I'm going to start just by talking in general briefly about molecular biology and the areas that are being studied, and then talk about the two big histologies that we deal with in non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma and squamous cell cancer, and what the genes are that we're finding that cause those tumors. And then next, what the targeted inhibitors of those genes may be and what opportunities there may be in the future. Um, clearly, immunotherapy is becoming a big deal, and I'm going to try to talk about how that might fit into the molecular biology of the tumors. Um, and then I'm going to end briefly with the cancer stem cell hypothesis and how that might change how we do things uh, in the future. So a lot to go through, and I'll be quick about it. Um, so here's the central dogma of molecular biology, just for folks that are a long way from medical school. So there's DNA, RNA, and protein, and clearly the proteins uh, are what cause the cells to run. Um, most of the analyses that are done on lung cancer are done at the DNA level, and so the, the sequencing studies that I'm going to show you give us a lot of information, um, but it's unclear how many of those things are actually translated into protein and how many of them are actually driving tumor formation. Um, there are some other things here, like epigenetics, which, which are sort of transcription factors at the promoter regions or in the introns that I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about microRNA, which are inhibitory RNAs that bind to the five or the three prime untranslated region uh, of messenger RNAs, um, but those are clearly important, although not clinically useful um, right now. And so uh, the NIH, the NCI, has started a, the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, or TCGA, and there's been two high-profile papers that have come out uh, over the last few years, uh, one on adenocarcinoma, one on squamous, where they did comprehensive molecular profiling, so DNA sequencing, mRNA, microarrays, um, various uh, analyses of, uh, of amplification and deletion on lung adenocarcinomas, so over 400 lung adenocarcinomas here. Um, and they, they made a lot of figures that are, are beautiful figures, and if you, if you walk through them, there's some interesting information in them. And so, clearly, um, P53 in, in adenocarcinoma is, is in 40 percent of cases, 46 percent of cases uh, mutated. Unfortunately, we don't have any targeted inhibitors of that, of that gene. Um, next is KRAS, which is about a third of tumors, um, and those tend to happen more in smokers, so transversions happen in smokers. So you can see P53 and KRAS are kind of smoker-associated mutations whereas EGFR, which is fifth on the list, uh, it happens more in non-smokers, and that, that's something that we already know. It also happens more often in females. Um, there's a number of other mutations that they found in this analysis that, that have many fewer patients with them. Many of them have targeted inhibitors that will be tried over the next several years. They did find multiple aberrant RNA transcripts, and these are sort of fusion proteins, and this is usually ALK and ROS, and so there are many different things that, that, uh, that bind uh, at the DNA level to ALK and ROS in these transversions and cause ALK and ROS uh, upregulation. Um, and ALK and ROS are uh, targeted by crizotinib, and they happen in about a 1 percent uh, of tumors. When they did this large-scale analysis, they, they broke it down into tumors that we already knew had a driving oncogene and tumors that we didn't know had a driving oncogene, and, and they were able to find some genes that, that are that are new oncogenes. So, you know, you always see this kind of uh, figure down at the bottom right where EGFR is about 10 to 15 percent of cases, KRAS is about a third of cases, BRAF is a small number, uh, and they found MET, ERB2, RIT1, and NF1 mutations in previously oncogene negative cancers. One, one sort of sobering piece, though, is that even though they find new mutations, clearly P53 is the, the dominant uh, oncogenic stimulus, it's a tumor suppressor in oncogene-negative tumors, and we don't have a P53 uh, targeted inhibitor as of yet. Um, they also broke it down by sort of key pathways, so this is sort of how the proteins interact with each other. At the top of the screen are all of the receptor tyrosine kinases and, and the percentages of each tumor, so again, EGFR is about 10 to 15 percent. KRAS, which we don't have any good inhibitors for, is about a third. Um, these are mutually exclusive, again, and they're in the same pathway, which is why they're mutually exclusive. Um, we do have targeted inhibitors of most of these things. Uh, the EGFR ones work the best. I'm going to go more into that uh, in a little bit. There's all sorts of other phenotypes that these, uh, besides just proliferation and cell survival, that these genes cause, um, and we have some inhibitors of some of these genes at the bottom, uh, but this is relatively young compared to targeted inhibi inhibition of tyrosine kinases. 
there's, there's a ton of other information in this paper, and it's, it's useful to sort of go through it, although much of it isn't clinically relevant. When they break down the RNA subtypes, it seems like there's three big types uh, of, of tumors based on RNA, proximal proliferative, proximal inflammatory, and terminal respiratory unit. These are more like what we used to call the BACs, these terminal respiratory units. You can see that EGFR mutation clusters with those. Some KRAS mutations do. Um, and these are the, the histologies, uh, and you can see that most of the solid tumors are pro proximal inflammatory, and most of the mucinous ones are, are sort of KRAS tumors. So there is some ability to, to, to uh, match up the histology with the, the genetic drivers, uh, but this is still relatively young. Um, they did the same thing in squamous two years earlier. Squamous, is a, squamous tumors, we have many fewer therapeutic options for. Uh, most of the patients with squamous tumors uh, get cisplatin doublets. Uh, as you can see, P53 mutation is the, is the major mutation in, in squamous tumors, and again, we don't have a target inhibitor of that. Um, most of these genes uh, do not have targeted inhibitors, and so squamous is kind of an orphan disease in terms of targeted inhibitor treatment, and that makes it a big uh, opportunity for people to study it. Uh, here's a similar pathway analysis from that paper. Uh, it does show that because squamous tumors happen more often in smokers, and smokers have a lot more oxidative metabolism, uh, that this uh, KEEP NFE2L2 uh, pathway is often um, uh, mutated in this tumor. So either KEEP1 mutations that, are, uh, that, that cause loss of function or gain of function of this would cause proliferation, um, and those are thought to be uh, happening more in smokers than non-smokers. Um, and then there's squamous differentiation gene, SOX2, which is a stem cell gene, and P63, which is a marker of squamous tumors, uh, are altered in many, many tumors. And those things downregulate the notch pathway, um, which is another stem cell pathway. So there may be some stem cell biology here uh, that I'll get to at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. They did a similar uh, RNA analysis of, of these tumors, uh, and they find that they break down into four subgroups. Um, and the, the one that we see, I think, most up in it is this classical subgroup with SOX2 mutation, these oxidative metabolism mutations, and then uh, P10 mutation, which upregulates the PI3 kinase. Uh, we don't have very good PI3 kinase inhibitors, even though this pathway is very important on the left side of the screen here in squamous cell tumors. So hopefully, if more uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that target the PI3 kinase pathway come on board, uh, we'll have better treatment, better targeted treatment of squamous tumors. There are some FGF receptor uh, uh, targeted therapies, but those are only a small number of tumors. And you can see that RAS is usually not mutated in squamous tumors. So one of the things, if you have a tumor that's undifferentiated, you can't tell if it's adeno or squamous. If there's a KRAS mutation, it's almost always an adenocarcinoma. So there are some therapeutic opportunities here, but squamous cell tumors are much, uh, much worse understood than, than adenocarcinomas. So now I'm going to switch over to targeted inhibition. And so this is just a, a sort of a busy slide about how chemotherapy has advanced over time. Um, and you can see we're, we're living in an era where, where these targeted inhibitors over the last 10 to 15 years have really uh, come to the fore. And uh, you can see the right side of the screen has many more advances than the left side of the screen. Every year, every month, it seems like there's a new targeted inhibitor coming out, um, mostly an adenocarcinoma, as I mentioned. Um, but uh, th then EGFR inhibition, which I'm going to talk about next, uh, has been with us for several years, and there's already three generations of inhibitors that may help us to overcome resistance. So it's an exciting time to be taking care of lung cancer patients, although most of this is not stuff that we do. Um, I, here's the EGFR schematic. Uh, so EGFR is a, is a receptor uh, that's at the, the, the cell membrane. Uh, it has two EGF binding sites, so these bind the ligand. Here's the transmembrane domain. On the inside of the cell is the kinase, so this is what phosphorylates downstream molecules and then an autophosphorylation site where, where, uh, where ATP binds as well. These are the exons. Uh, the, the mutations that have been found in green are ones that are sensitive to erlotinib. So if, if you have the, any of these mutations, and most of them are XT, exon 19 deletions or this L858R and exon 21, that's 85% uh, of the mutations. Those are all sensitive to erlotinib. The problem is when you treat someone with erlotinib, they often develop these mutations in red led by this one T790M, which changes the molecule so that erlotinib no longer works. Um, third generation EGFR inhibitors can block the T790M molecule, so there's clinical trials going on now to try those patients uh, on the third generation TKI inhibitors. 
EGFR inhibitor resistance is, is very well studied at this point. When you go to a, a study section of, of grants about lung cancer, I, I, half of them, it seems like, are about different ways that, that tumors are able to get around EGFR inhibition. Like I said, most of it is T790M, but there's all, all kinds of other pathways uh, that, that cells can use to get around uh, the inhibition. So there's going to be a lot more drugs coming down the pipeline and combinations of drugs to try to over, overcome this resistance in the future. Um, so that leads to paradigms for treatment that include the targeted inhibitors. And so clearly, at this point, if you have an EGFR mutation or an ALK mutation in stage 4 disease, you're going to start with these targeted inhibitors rather than chemotherapy. If you're squamous, like I said, there's no targeted inhibitors, so you're going to get platinum-based doublet, and then on second line, something with uh, one of the taxanes in it in general. If you're EGFR and ALK negative in adenocarcinoma, you're going to get the same thing. So a large opportunity here and a large opportunity here, although these patients we can treat them, they do develop resistance relatively quickly. I, I put this up here, this is a relatively uh, busy slide, but just to say that the, the medical oncologists need biopsies, and so I think for us, we're seeing a lot more patients who are stage four who, who really don't have a surgical indication, but the medical oncologists need tissue to sequence to see if there's any of these mutations, and I think this is going to come up more and more in the future. Um, so minimally invasive ways to, to biopsy these patients, to give tissue to the medical oncologist is going to be uh, important in the future as well. Yesterday we talked a little bit about the Alchemist trial. Um, Dennis talked about it, um, but clearly this is going to be important in the next several years as we resect these patients. So this is for stage 1B to 3A patients who are resected. Uh, the patients are going to get uh, sequenced. Uh, many of them are going to be screened for mutations. The ones that have uh, mutations are going to be then treated. Uh, if you're EGFR mutant or ALK, uh, mutant, uh, then you can either get uh, the targeted inhibitors, or if you're negative, then you can get uh, immunotherapy. So there's three different arms uh, coming in adjuvant uh, setting after, after lung cancer, and we should all, uh, after lung cancer resection, and we should all be involved uh, in these trials. So now I'm going to move on to immunotherapy. Um, this is, is, I think, the biggest uh, advance uh, that we've seen in lung cancer in, in, in years and years. So targeted inhibitors are important, but this is a schematic of how these immunotherapy uh, drugs work. Um, the T cells that come into the tumor uh, have a T cell receptor which binds to uh, MHC with antigen on it, um, and that activates the T cell, but they have these molecules called CTLA-4, which is uh, blocked by ablumumab, and PD-1, which is blocked by nivolumab. And the tumor cells often have PD-L1, which is a ligand for PD-1. This, these molecules turn off the T cell, and so Tumors have a way with this PDL1 ligand to bind PD1 and turn off the T cell and make so there's T cells there, but they're not working. And so if you give either ipilimumab to turn off the CTLA4 pathway or nivolumab to turn off the PDL PD1 pathway, you can re-energize uh, this T cell to kill the tumor cell. Um, this slide also has many of these target inhibitors on it, and there's a lot of energy uh, with the drug companies to, to combine these therapies. So give an immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor along with many of these target inhibitors, and I think we're going to see a lot of trials about this kind of thing in the future. Um, there's been some, some very good studies, some very interesting studies about who responds to these drugs. So how do we pick people who should get the immunotherapy drugs? Um, this is a science paper from, uh, from, from Dr. Rizvi and the group at, at Memorial, um, and there's a lot of uh, words and figures here. but. DCB is durable clinical response, and NDB is no discernible benefit. And so when they did this trial where they gave people PD-1 blockade, and then they looked at who responded and who didn't, you responded if you had a lot of antigens. And so if you, if you have a high mutational burden you, in your tumor, if you sequence the tumor, if you have a lot of new antigens, neoantigens that the tumor has, you do a lot better with these drugs than if you don't. And so clearly, if, if you have a high mutation rate tumor, squamous uh, tends to have a lot of mutations because people are smokers, um, then th these drugs work better. So there may be a role for sequencing tumors, trying to find what the mutation rate of the tumors is, and then treat with, with immunotherapy. Um, and this just says that a little bit better. The durable cl clinical benefit people are in green, and the no discernible benefit people are in red. And as you can see, the, the green ones have more mutations than the red ones. And that, again, correlates with smoking. So down at the bottom, the the transversion high or the purple, so the, the clinical benefit people were almost all smokers, whereas the people who didn't benefit were, sort of, were all non-smokers. So it may be that these immunotherapy 
drugs are going to work better in smoking squamous cell patients. And here's just another uh, uh, blow up of the graph. Uh, these durable clinical benefit people had more mutations uh, than the people who didn't have it. Another paper that just came out in science, this one's from London, um, and this talks about clonal antigens and tumor heterogeneity. And so uh, these blue bars are, are clonal antigens in tumors. So these are seven tumors uh, in panel A. And the lower panel, are, the lower blue bars are clonal antigens, uh, whereas the red and yellow bars are, are subclonal antigens. So when you go to different places in the tumor and sequence, are the antigens the same or are the antigens different? And if you have a lot of heterogeneity, you do worse. So if you have higher clonal tumors, you do better here in the blue line. And if you have a lot of heterogeneity like this tumor or this tumor, no, low blue levels, uh, then you do worse. Those are the red lines. Um, and if you have a low neoantigen burden, you do worse. And so it's not just the antigen burden, it's also the, the heterogeneity of the tumors in the, in the, that are sequenced. And here they can look at the T cells and see the same thing. So this one has T cells. All these blue cells are to the one clonal antigen, where in here there's a bunch of different T cells that are uh, specific for a bunch of subclonal antigens. And when you look at it, these are the responses. Uh, the people who have poor response have subclonal antigens, whereas the people who have good responses have clonal antigens. So if all of your tumor cells have neoantigens and there are T cells to those neoantigens, you do better with these targeted inhibitors, these checkpoint inhibitors. Lastly, I'm going to talk about the cancer stem cell hypothesis. And so this is something that's been around for a while, but I think is becoming more and more popular. And so normal tissues have stem cells. Um, and if those stem cells develop a mutation, then the tumors that they d differentiate into have stem cells and differentiated cells. If we give traditional chemotherapy that, st that spares the stem cells, then the tumor is going to come back. But if we had a stem cell targeted therapy, then we could get tumor death. Um, and, and experimentally, people are starting to show this. And there are CD133 positive cells in many tumors, and those seem to be tumor initiating cells in at least some subset of lung cancers. AD, aldehyde dehydrogenase, Dr. Minna's group has shown, is, a, is another marker of these tumor initiating stem cells in adenocarcinoma. Um, a, a, D, ALDH positive cells tend to be the tumor initiating cells. And those cells are cisplatin resistant. So the CD133 positive cells, if you give cisplatin in a, in a, in a study, uh, you, you can get rid of the tumors, whereas the CD133 negative cells uh, are able to be cleared. The CD133 positive cells are not with cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So we may need stem cell treatments, and in here they use a notch inhibitor to kill the stem cells. Lastly, about stem cells, squamous cell tumors tend to have, I think, more stem cells than adenocarcinomas. These are mouse models of lung cancer, and, and this, the stem cells in these tumors are SCA1 positive and NGFR positive. And these uh, stem cells, the SCA1 positive, NGFR positive group, have more PDL1 on the bottom panels here. So it may be that immunotherapy is a good stem cell uh, killer, uh, and so immunotherapy may work both on the immune system as well as on stem cells. Um, so that was a lot of information, um, and this, these, this is the summary. I think sequencing studies, and those two studies I showed at the beginning, identify drivers of lung cancer that may be therapeutically targetable. Uh, I think immunotherapy is exciting, and neoantigens are important, um, and we're going to be studying this even more in the future. Stem cell directed therapy may be useful, and I think we're going to be important here. I think that window of opportunity trials uh, will be helpful in the future, and we need to be a part of those. Um, so I'll be happy to take questions. I, I don't know if we do it at the end. We're going to do questions at the end. Okay. Thank you. Great.